Revelation of Christ, talking about the Bible as a fundamental Christianity. And our brother Will Riley is going to come and talk about that. He's a, uh, a participant, a member of the body here at Grace Ambassadors. And so uh, please welcome him as he comes up to talk. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning. I am glad to be here this morning, and it's really encouraging to see so many people here uh, to learn about the truth, to learn about the fundamentals of the faith. And uh, I know that um, for some of us here, a lot of what we talk about today, what we're going to cover, uh, might seem like review to you. Um, but these are foundational doctrines, and we're the ones in this room aren't the only ones that are going to be listening to these messages. Um, we're going to be uh, posting these on the internet, and other people are going to be able to benefit from what we talk about today. Um, also, uh, for anyone who may be thinking that this is going to seem like a review, have you ever done a really long math equation? And you get to the end of it, and you check it against your answer key, and you find out that you got the wrong answer, right? And so you go back to the previous portion of the equation, like, maybe I got that wrong. Well, maybe I got that wrong. And you go back further and further and further until you find out that your mistake happened way at the very beginning of your equation. And had you known that, you may have ended up with the correct answer. And so these fundamentals are important for that reason. Go ahead and open your bulletin. I want to take a look at the things we're going to be talking about. <clears throat> Just the titles of our lessons, the Revelation of Christ, the Bible, the Godhead of Christ, the Trinity, the Person of Christ, God in the flesh, the work of Christ, salvation, the power of Christ, resurrection, the judgment of Christ, the body of Christ, the church. All of these things mean absolutely nothing if you don't know those words. If you don't understand where those things come from, they're meaningless to you. So I've been tasked with uh, the objective of helping you to understand the doctrine of the fundamental doctrine of your Bible. Uh, which would be the revelation of Christ. So my objective today is um, to establish the importance and relevance of God's Word. I'm going to be covering three major Bible doctrines that will help you to understand this uh, foundational doctrine. And then finally, I'm going to be highlighting the overarching purpose of God's Word, why we have it. So let's just get started here. Um, the importance and relevance of the Bible. Why do we need it? Um, Christians are people of a book. Um, we always have been. And there's a reason for that. Turn with me uh, to Job chapter 31. People say the Bible is not relevant today. And I would beg to differ with that. In Job chapter 31 we gain the benefit of someone with an experience that we will never have in our whole lives. Everyone in this room has had access to the Bible pretty readily for their entire life. But Job has a different story. In Job chapter 31, verse 35, we see his desire. He says, Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that my adversary had written a book. Look at that. We have the exact thing that Job was desiring. He was troubled. He was confused. He didn't understand things. And he was asking for a book. He wasn't asking for a story. He was asking for words that he could read and understand. People today pray all the time for God to reveal his will to them. What's God's will for my life? You see sermons preached all over the world about God's will for your life. You see books written, the purpose-driven life. What's God want for you? Uh, but the book has already been written, and the answer is already given. Turn to 1 Timothy 2. This is just one example of God's will for your life. So if you are one of the ones who are curious about what God will have you do, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Beginning in verse 3, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Let me slow that down for anyone who missed it. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, 
who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. This is God's will in black and white. And it may not have anything to do with who you marry or what job you take or where you decide to live in the world, but it has everything to do with your knowledge of the truth. Um, God's will has been laid out and we can search it. Books also have been written and countless sermons preached about how the Lord works in mysterious ways. You've heard this Christian cop out several times, I'm sure, and I've been guilty of it myself in my ignorance, trying to explain things that we don't understand. Well, the Lord works in mysterious ways, and that's the nail in the coffin, right? You've ended the argument, and they can't say anything else because, well, I guess, I guess he does work in mysterious ways. I don't know. You don't know, right? Uh, I would submit the idea today that the Lord is not working in mysterious ways now, and the reason for that is that we have His words completed in our hands, and we can understand the mysteries of Christ. So, uh, look with me in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 8. Paul's talking here and he says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So this is some Christianese language you've heard before, the unsearchable riches. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So God's been hiding things from us. He works in mysterious ways, so that makes sense. But look in verse 10. It says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. These mysteries weren't kept hidden. They were kept, but now they've been revealed. We see this phrase, but now, all throughout Paul's uh, epistles, but uh, I don't have time to get into that study today. So we also see in verse 9, Paul's saying uh, he wants to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So we're able to see these things. These things are made known. The mysteries have been revealed. Another example would be in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 19, Paul again is saying, For me, he's praying, uh, asking for prayer, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Not to keep secret the mystery of the gospel or just to share it with the hidden few, but rather to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 7, we see more about this mystery. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So there was a purpose behind the mystery. There was a purpose why it was hidden. And now that purpose has been revealed. Look in verse 9. It says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And preachers love this verse because it helps them to explain away the things of God that they don't understand themselves. I has not seen nor ear heard, and that's where they stop. But if they went one verse further, they would understand way more. Look at verse 10. It says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. These mysteries have been revealed to us through God's Spirit. And in verse 12, he says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So God's not keeping these secrets. He does not work in mysterious ways. He's revealed all of these secrets to us in his word. <clears throat> so it's important to understand that without the Bible, without the revelation of Christ, salvation is impossible. That's why this is important. Uh, we understand the relevancy of the word. People are asking these questions that are answered by the Bible. And so the Bible is relevant, but why is it important? And that's because... Salvation would be impossible without it. Without the truths we learn from God's word rightly divided, you would still be in your sin. You would have no hope. There would be no resurrection for you after death. This would be it. 
If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, right? I want to talk today about the three major Bible doctrines. Um, there's a great resource on the website that Justin has written uh, talking about seven Bible doctrines. And this is a pretty well comprehensive list, and uh, it's fantastic. Today I'm going to deal with three of those things, uh, which can also be found in Brother Terry McLean's uh, Dispensational Bible Institute study at his website, uh, another great resource. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about the three doctrines of inspiration, utilization, and preservation. So beginning with inspiration, um, <clears throat> I want to establish the fact that God is the author of the Bible. Okay, you've heard several times that men wrote the Bible and that kind of thing. We'll deal with that a little bit. But God is the author of these words. Uh, we'll see that here in just a moment. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 36. In Jeremiah 36, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1, <clears throat> it talks about the word of the Lord there at the end of verse 1, right? Uh, this word came into Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and so on and so forth. Um, less important about what the words are right now, I want to talk about where they're coming from. It says, the word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, take thee a roll of a book. So where they're coming from, and then what is Jeremiah doing with them? He's writing them down. Now, why would this be necessary? Jeremiah heard the very words of the Lord. I th think he's going to remember that, right? But why does he have to write them down? Maybe he would forget. Or maybe other people would need to hear these things, right? And so this is where we understand um, inspiration. This is where we understand the Bible written for our benefit. Another example, look at 2 Peter. I know I've got you jumping all over the place, but it is a lesson about the Bible. So, <laughs> In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. We learn another way that God speaks. It says, uh, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So these holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We saw in Jeremiah it was God speaking. Here we have the Holy Ghost speaking through men. And in Hebrews chapter 1, <clears throat> We see yet another way that God speaks. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1. <clears throat> It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So here's Christ, God, speaking to us. The words of God come in different ways at different times, but it's important to remember that they are always authored by God, whether it's the Holy Spirit or Jesus Christ or God himself. God is the author. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and that's important to keep in mind. So God being the author, humans held the pens. Uh, this is I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. This is not a difficult concept to understand. God, just like with Jeremiah, is using the instrumentation of humanity to manifest his word to the rest of humanity. And the general argument is, well, men are fallible beings. And how can we place our faith, our eternal life, our judgment, and all of these heavy things on a book that's written by fallible men? And the way I deal with this uh, is... Pretty simple. We're talking about the creator of the universe. The assumption we're making is that God is the creator of all things. And wouldn't we think that a person who created the world and the universe and the innumerable stars would be able to use imperfect instrumentation to produce a perfectly preserved work? I think that's pretty easy to handle, uh, but the world tends to reject God as the source of scripture, and you will come up against this opposition. 
And the reason they do this, there's another resource on the website I used for this lesson plan um, called the Embarrassment of Inspiration. Uh, and this is all the scholars in the world, all the scientists in the world, they're embarrassed by this book because what it contains is truth that was known long before it was ever discovered by men. It's actually just affirmed. The truths that we understand are affirmed. I want to run through just a few examples. I'm not going to have you turn there because of, we don't have a whole lot of time. But we learn the shape of the earth is round in Isaiah. That wouldn't be discovered until centuries later. We learn that the world is suspended out in outer space on nothing in Job. In Jeremiah, we learn that the stars are innumerable. For centuries, people thought you could number the stars. You could find them all. And more and more, we get telescopes that can search further and further into the universe. And there's no way to number the stars. This was all written in the Bible. We've discovered recently that there are valleys, lakes, and springs under the sea. And this is something that you can read in 2 Samuel and in Genesis. Also, the moon's effect on the sea, the tides. This was mentioned in the Bible before anyone would ever make that connection. And so, how would these things ever be predicted in a book like this, written by fallible men? Uh, I would submit the idea that this book is authored by God. He created the universe, he created the world, and these things are affirmed by scientists today. And they're all evidence that this is a divinely inspired book. So it's been thousands of years, and God's word still stands. And my question for you in a post-truth age is how in the world does the Bible still stand? If this book is routinely rejected by the educated and erudite of the world, Celebrities and people on platforms will mock this book. It's regarded as a silly, unreasonable, and immoral book. How in the world is it still here? It would crumble under its own falsehood if it were false. <coughs> I want to uh, talk today about the Bible standing on its own power because it is God's word. We've seen uh, that uh, science and um, the understandings that we have in our world are already affirmed here in the scriptures um, and that no other book in human history has had such an impact on the world as this book. No other book has been criticized as harshly as this book for however long it's been around. No other book has been scrutinized as closely, studied as earnestly, or interpreted as extensively as the Bible. And so with all of this scrutiny, this book has been under a microscope for thousands of years, 400 years or more in the English language alone, you would think it would crumble under its own falsehood, but it doesn't. I encourage you today um, to understand the doctrine of inspiration and take God at his word. Uh, come to the Bible believing that it is inspired and allow God to be true and every man a liar. Turn to Romans chapter 10. This will lead me into my uh, second Bible doctrine. In Romans 10, 17, Paul writes that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is what makes any faith possible. Without it, our faith would be in our own scholarship. It would be in our own experience, our own circumstances, our own emotions. And these things are all movable. These things are all liquid and fluid. The Bible is solid. It is a foundation, and it is something that we can trust to hold us up. The second doctrine I want to talk about today is utilization. So we've uh, covered the inspiration. We understand that the Bible comes from a, div of a divine source, from God himself. But the utilization, what do we do with it now? We've got this heavy weight now, right? These are the very words of God. What do we do with it? How do we regard it? And uh, I want to break that down into three little parts. Um, we study it, we apply it, and we preach it. And this all comes from Scripture, these instructions. Look at 2 Timothy 2.15. <clears throat> 2 This is kind of a banner verse that we use here at Grace Ambassadors. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, the direct instruction is to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I'm sure we'll get more into that as the seminar progresses. 
But also in Acts, look back in Acts chapter 17. In Acts 17, 11, <clears throat> we learn something about these people, these Bereans. It says they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Is this something that you're doing? Are you utilizing God's word in this way? Are you more noble? Are you receiving the word with all readiness of mind? And are you searching the scriptures daily, comparing scripture with scripture? Are you studying God's word? We're exhorted to uh, be wise in Ephesians 5.17. I will butcher it if I try to quote it. So, Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> in verse 17, it says, be, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So we looked earlier today at the will of God, and we can read that all day long, but if we don't study it, we'll never understand it. Many of us in the room maybe are at a higher level of understanding because of the study that we've done, but only because of the study that we've done. If you just keep reading it, that's not enough. Comparing Scripture with Scripture and understanding God's words, trying to figure out the answers and understanding that God is true is the only way to gain this understanding. <clears throat> Secondly, we need to apply the Scripture. And this is uh, where a lot of people go wrong, um, and I'm not going to focus a whole lot on that today. Look at 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse 13, this is about application of Scripture. He says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. This effectual working that Paul is talking about comes only from your application. You can read it, you can study it all day long, but if you don't apply these things to your life, then there's no way you can benefit from it and have this effectually working in you. And so this application, again, is broken down into three main parts. There's historical application, which is easy enough to understand. You can read the account of the flood. You can read about the Garden of Eden, Tower of Babel, Pentecost, uh, the death of Christ and the Acts of the Apostles. All of this stuff is uh, events in human history that we can read and understand. And so historical application is one way. There's spiritual application, uh, which is where a lot of people will go wrong. Um, spiritual application, look at Proverbs. While I was doing my study, I was just kind of playing around a little bit, and I just flipped through my Bible with my thumb, plopped it open, and set my finger down. Um, and I landed on Proverbs 16.32. I know pastors that do that. And uh, they take no thought for what they ought to say, things like that, and they let the Spirit lead, and uh, people eat it up. In Proverbs 16.32, it says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit than he that takes a city. This is great. This is a great spiritual truth that we can understand and apply to our lives in that way. Uh, you can keep your anger in check. This is great. Uh, but... Uh, there are other places, like Numbers 14.32, for example, and Justin's going to make fun of me because I use this as my example, um, but Numbers 14.32, it says, But as for you, these carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, right? So this is not a spiritual application that you want to try to force into your life, okay? So there's, there's correct spiritual application and incorrect. Um, the other way, the third way to apply doctrine or apply the scripture to your life is, is doctrinal, Okay? Uh, and this is the most important. Uh, I want to say that the doctrinal application of Scripture is only beneficial to you if it's rightly divided, if you're rightly dividing the Word. This doctrinal application has to be taken into account. Uh, I want to use a couple of simple examples to explain this. 
Look at Genesis, all the way back in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, verse 29, talking about the doctrinal application of Scripture. In Genesis 1, 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So, of course, we've got Adam here in the garden, and God is giving his instructions about what would be suitable for Adam to eat. As we move through the scripture, we understand that the dietary restrictions change. And by the time we get to 1 Timothy chapter 4, we learn something completely different. 1 Timothy chapter 4, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1, says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You say, what does this have to do with diet? What does this have to do with my food? Well, in verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. And so, in Genesis, we've got dietary restrictions uh, to the uh, herb-bearing seed. And then we've got here, uh, no restrictions at all. So which one of these things are you going to doctrinally apply to your life? Which one of these are you going to participate in? You have to make those distinctions. Similarly, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're learning about the nation of Israel here and their instructions. Deuteronomy 6.25 describes... How to go about obtaining righteousness. This is a little different than what you eat. A little more important. Deuteronomy 6, beginning in 24, says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. <coughs> So this is instruction in righteousness, which all scripture is profitable for that, right? I want you to turn to Romans chapter 3. And you will have to make a choice. Romans chapter 3, in verse 21. Up in verse 20 it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And 21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So which of these two things, from Deuteronomy 6.25, being commandment keeping for your instruction in righteousness, and Romans chapter 3, being righteousness manifested without the law, which of those are you going to doctrinally participate in? This is a choice you have to make, and that's how you apply scripture. Lastly, for utilization, it must be preached. We're given this instruction several times. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.18. We learn a lot about preaching here. Paul says... For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us, us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? We talked about that a little earlier. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So by the foolishness of preaching, we learn how to be saved. <clears throat> Look also in uh, Titus. Titus 1. <clears throat> Uh, 
beginning in verse 1. It says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. So we see this uh, doctrine of utilization, and we're ending up with preaching the word. The doctrine of utilization is necessary, and without it one cannot have faith, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And also, this is the way that uh, God manifests his word, is through preaching. Moving on from utilization into our third major Bible doctrine, this is the doctrine of preservation. And this discusses the idea of how God's words got from inspiration to us today in 2016. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about textual criticism. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about manuscript evidence. Um, I want to just focus on the fact that without preservation, without God perfectly preserving his words, we don't have them. Um, this doctrine is necessary for your faith. Let's see what God has to say about his words. Turn to Psalm 12. Sure, several... There are other psalmists that wrote these um, psalms that we find, but we've already established who the author of the Bible is. In Psalm 12, six and seven, <clears throat> it says, "The words of the Lord are pure words, pure, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times." Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, and thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So we understand the pure and eternal nature. In Psalm 119, in verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. In Isaiah 40, it says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Let's see what Jesus has to say about God's words in Matthew 5. This is probably a familiar verse for most of us who've been in church our whole lives. Matthew 5, 18, it says, uh, this is Christ speaking, He says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. And we also find in Psalm 138 that uh, God magnifies his word above his very name. So understanding the gravity of the words of God and how seriously God takes his word, I feel like he would make sure that it would be preserved. He would make sure that these words of truth would remain true. Some people believe that God's infallible word only existed in the original manuscripts, you may have heard this before, and there's one big problem with that, and that is there are none. There are no original manuscripts. So if that's the only place God's word existed, where's our faith? <clears throat> we only have copies of copies of copies, um, and I don't believe God would leave us with inadequate material. I don't believe he would leave us to our own best guesses. And I certainly don't believe he would leave us to trust pastors who have taken two semesters of Greek to teach us what the Bible really says. We know what the Bible really says because we have it in a book in English, perfectly preserved by God himself. If we are instructed to read this book, understand it, believe it, obey it, teach it, preach it, and ultimately be judged by what's in this book, we need to have a copy of them. And not only that, it needs to be perfect. It needs to be infallible, and it needs to be from God. And it is incumbent upon God to provide his perfectly preserved words to us if he expects us to follow his instructions. That's where my faith lies, in God himself being true to his own word. At Grace Ambassadors, we hold the position that the King James Bible is a product of God's promised obligation to perfectly preserve his words. God has providentially preserved his inspired word for us to utilize, study, and preach. It is presented without error for the English-speaking people in the King James authorized version of the Bible. As you study, as you apply, and as you preach this word, it's 
your responsibility to discern for yourself if the Bible in your hands is God's perfectly preserved word. And uh, that's not always easy to do. And it's definitely not always easy to stand in that position when you come up against the opposition. Uh, I want to conclude um, today with the purpose of God's word. Why do we have it? We've established the inspiration. We know that these are God's words. We've established that we have to use it and we have to rightly divide it. We, we've also understood that this Bible is perfect and God has kept his promise to preserve his word. But why did he do that? And I want to submit the idea today that God inspired and preserved his words all the way throughout history for us to have in our hands to do nothing other than to reveal the mystery of Christ. This is found in, first, or found in Colossians chapter 1. The Bible does a way better job at explaining why it's here than I could. Colossians chapter 1 beginning in verse 14 speaks of Christ. <clears throat> in Colossians 1, 14, talking about uh, God translating us into the kingdom of his dear son, who's Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, which, by the way, would not be in a non-King James translation, through his blood is omitted, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Keep in mind, this is talking about Christ. This isn't talking about God the Father. This is Jesus Christ. By him, all things were created, by him and for him. And he is before all things, well, I thought Jesus Christ was born, right? And by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him, the Son, should all fullness dwell. God reveals the mystery of Christ through his Bible. In Ephesians 1, <clears throat> you'll turn there with me. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Again, it's not kept secret. In Ephesians 1, it says, uh, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. This is important. Romans 16, 25 <clears throat> says, Now to him that is pow of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Our faith has to have an object, and that object is Christ. And finally, in Colossians 1.27, this is where I'll end. <clears throat> Colossians 1, verse 27, talking about us, those who are saved, the mystery which was hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the overarching purpose of why we have God's perfectly preserved, inspired word that we ought to utilize is so that God could reveal the mystery of Christ to us and, that, and we could preach it to the people who don't know it. So without inspiration, there is no authorship, there is no authority, Without utilization, there is no opportunity for faith, and there is no manifestation. And without preservation, there's nothing at all. And that's where I would leave you today. If you have any questions, I can take those now to the best of my ability.